Stop leeching off me already! For over two decades, I thought I was giving my all to William. Yet, this is how he sees me? I wasn't leeching off him. I was just devoted to you. That's what I thought, but the words wouldn't come. As my strength drained away, William continued. Now that Daniel's working, you've got no reason to leech off me anymore. But. Shut up. I don't want to hear your excuses. William raised his voice. It's over. My feelings never reached him. Just as I realized that, I heard something snap inside me. It was the sound of the thread of love that had been connecting our hearts, snapping. At the same time, my feelings for William began to fade. We were spouses just moments ago, but now, we're like strangers. William was just using me all along. He never loved me. Otherwise, he wouldn't brazenly cheat and try to kick me out. I don't care what happens to such a man. The only option left is to completely crush him. I've made up my mind. I lifted my face and gazed at William. My name is Susan, I'm 50 years old. I've been married to my husband William for 25 years. Our son Daniel, born a few years after we got married, graduated from college and started working this year. Child rearing is done, and now I can do what I want. That's what I'm thinking right now. But there's just one problem. That's my relationship with William. William is not a good husband or father. In fact, it's hard to find anything good about him. He cheats, and he doesn't even give me a proper salary. I at least want you to give me enough money for living expenses. Huh? Don't get cocky when you're living off me. William always snaps back like this. I guess it's hopeless. Maybe divorce is the only option. Lately, I've been thinking about it more and more. But I can't just say I want a divorce easily. The reason is, my FIL Stephen, who is sick and hospitalized, asked me to take care of William. I owe Stephen, and as long as I can bear it, I have to endure it, don't I? I can't ignore Stephen's words, but my desire to divorce is strong. Caught between these conflicting feelings, I find myself reminiscing about the happier times before marriage. Ironically, that happiness began with a misfortune that befell my father. Our family ran a small restaurant. My father was in charge of cooking, and my mother managed the hall. Needless to say, the food was delicious. However, my father was incredibly bad at business. He started the restaurant with the desire to fill his customers' bellies with delicious food. That's a noble sentiment, I believe. But that sentiment alone drove his business. So, he hardly thought about profit. It didn't matter if the profit was small. As long as the customers were satisfied, that was enough for him. Obviously, this was no way to make a profit. As a result, our family's finances were always on the edge. Yet, seeing the satisfied customers, I felt proud, even as a child. So, I never interfered with my father's business. But during my college years, a crisis struck. The company supplying ingredients to my father's restaurant went bankrupt due to the recession. We had already paid for this month's supply, but now, we faced the prospect of closing the restaurant. Our management was already barely scraping by. There was no extra money to spare. Seeing my parents disheartened made me anxious too. But as a college student, there wasn't much I could do. Nor did it seem likely that the bankrupt company would refund us. The only option left for us was to close the restaurant. That's when a regular customer said. Closing down? But the food is so good. What a waste. But the supplier has gone bankrupt, and we're likely to be saddled with debt. Then let me support you personally. Use it to revive the restaurant. The regular, true to his word, lent my father the money. We appreciate it. We'll definitely pay you back. Don't worry about the money for now. Just keep making delicious meals. After saying that, the man quickly left the restaurant. Later, my father started dealing with a different food company. The regular was apparently involved in a large-scale food distribution business, and we got our supplies at a cheaper rate than before. 
Fortuitously, our family's restaurant was saved from bankruptcy. About a year later, I went with my father to repay the money to the regular customer. While my father was talking to the man, a young man approached me. So you borrowed money from my father? It turned out, he was the son of the man who lent us the money. His name was William, and he worked in his father's company. You're pretty. How about going out with me? Me, with you. Come on, think of it as a way to say thanks for the loan. We were indeed saved by the loan, and my father had properly expressed our gratitude. I didn't think we owed anything more, but then William whispered to me. I could spread rumors that the restaurant's daughter is ungrateful. That would be. I couldn't talk back. I thought it wouldn't affect me even if he spread rumors, but it could cause trouble for my father. And what would the restaurant's customers think? With these thoughts, I found myself unable to refuse William's offer. I didn't like it, but I decided to endure it, just this once. While pondering all this, I went out with William. But once we were out, it was more enjoyable than I expected. William was entertaining, knew various fun spots. And had a great taste in choosing places. Despite the terrible first impression, he might actually be a decent person. Thinking that was my mistake. I was swiftly wrapped around William's finger. Being with Susan is fun. I'm having fun too. With a nice girl like you, I'm thinking for the first time I could marry. Swept up by such simple words, I started dating William with a view of marriage. William continued to manipulate me in various ways. Eventually, a few years later, I found myself married to William. Of course, I never imagined then that it was all William's trap. He was kind and I felt loved by William. But it was all a lie. As soon as we got married, William showed his true colors. Here's this month's salary. Manage it well. Opening the envelope William handed me, I found a handwritten salary slip. The salary itself was deposited into the bank, so a slip alone wasn't odd. But it was strange that the salary slip was handwritten. Nowadays, handwritten documents are almost unheard of, but when I got married, it was 25 years ago. It was a time when computers were just beginning to become commonplace, and handwritten salary slips didn't seem out of place. There's more than $1,000, it seems enough. I muttered to myself, trying to be convinced. I managed somehow with that modest amount of money. As married life went on, I started to feel something was off. It was William's lifestyle. William left home at a fixed time every morning, but his return was always erratic. It varied daily. I'm busy with various tasks as my dad's successor. Then, at least let me know before you come home. Stop nagging, I get it. I'll call. William shouted. His attitude made me feel even more uneasy. Maybe he's out having fun. Perhaps there's someone else. Though I suspected, I couldn't confront him because I disliked being yelled at. In the end, I couldn't voice my doubts about William's behavior. Then Daniel was born. I thought things might change with a child. But William's attitude remained unchanged. Looking back, I think that's when it started. I began to vaguely consider divorce. And it was around the time Daniel started middle school. I received a call from my mother while I was out shopping for dinner. What, dad's hospitalized? It was news that my father was admitted to the hospital. I rushed to the hospital. Mom's just making a big deal on the phone. My father said, laughing heartily. I was relieved. But at that moment, I remembered something and my heart skipped a beat. I made a mistake. I hadn't contacted William. By then, it was too late. My mobile phone was flooded with calls from William. Panicking, I called back, only to hear William's irritated voice. Where the hell are you and what are you doing? Get back here and make my dinner. I'm sorry, Dad is... What? Dad? Your father? William's tone was stern as he questioned me. I answered in a small voice. Yes, he was suddenly hospitalized. Your father doesn't matter. You're my wife. 
startled by William's loud voice, I closed my eyes. I was terrified of his shouting, but I knew I had to stand up for myself. I gathered my courage and retorted. Is it wrong to be worried about my dad? That should be allowed, right? Shut up! Don't talk back to me! No, I will say this. You would rush to your own father, wouldn't you? William fell silent when I asked that. I thought it would hit close to home. But his reply was unimaginable. Huh? I'd ignore it if my dad was hospitalized. After all, I wouldn't be troubled if he wasn't around. I was speechless. That had to be a lie. But I couldn't deny it. After much hesitation, I told William. I'm different from you. Sorry, but you'll have to eat out tonight. That was all I could muster. I hung up the phone, still in a daze. Since that incident, I truly couldn't believe in William anymore. It was then I realized that the happy times before marriage were all an illusion. Oh, I see. William didn't want a wife, he wanted a maid. Saying it out loud made me sad. But I couldn't just dwell on the sadness. If I was going to divorce, I needed to prepare. I started preparing for a divorce. Years passed. And then Stephen was hospitalized. His condition was quite serious. He might not be able to leave the hospital. I relayed Stephen's medical condition to William, but he was unfazed. Does that mean it's going to cost money? It's not the time to worry about money, don't you understand? I understand. I'll contact my brother Donald. William reached out to Donald, my brother-in-law. Donald was married but had no children. So William asked if Donald could help with the hospital bills. Can you pay? It's tough for us, with Daniel and Susan and all. His attitude was as if it was someone else's problem. It reminded me of when my own father was hospitalized. It was clear he didn't care about Stephen at all. I couldn't bear it anymore. Enough. I'll manage somehow and pay for Stephen's hospital bills. Don't forget what you just said. William shouted. I nodded firmly. Ultimately, my declaration led to our family bearing the cost of Stephen's hospital bills. Moreover, Stephen stepped down from his position as president due to his illness. And William took over. Regardless, William didn't like that I had stood up to him. Since then, he started blatantly not coming home. Even when discussing Daniel's future plans. William ignored my calls and didn't come home. Dad's not coming home again today. I'm sorry, Daniel. I'm causing you trouble. It's fine, I don't care about Dad. More importantly, I want to go to college in Boston. That's right. Don't worry about tuition, I'll manage somehow. Soon after, Daniel's admission to a college in Boston was secured. As expected, William didn't see Daniel off. Once Daniel moved to Boston, the house became eerily quiet. By then, William's visits had dwindled to about once a week. There's also Stephen's hospital bills, could you transfer a little more? What? I've already transferred more than half of my salary. It should be enough for you now. The money William transferred was meager. It was clearly just a fraction of his salary. The claim of transferring more than half was undoubtedly a lie. I knew that. But I didn't have the energy to argue anymore. Years passed, and I got news that Daniel had landed a job. With Daniel employed, it might be time to bring up divorce. Over these years, I had prepared for divorce. Now, it's just about the right timing. Where and when can I bring it up to avoid arguments? Such thoughts kept haunting me. It's not about arguments, though. I chuckled wryly to myself. Then, one day. I had been visiting Stephen at the hospital. After chatting about trivial things, I headed back home as usual. As I tried to unlock the door, I was shocked. For some reason, the door was already open. Could it be a burglar? I cautiously peeked inside. From the living room, I could hear the TV and William's laughter. Relieved that William was home, I entered the living room. There, 
William was watching TV and laughing heartily. You're home. Yeah, I was thinking of tidying up. Tidying up? Heeding William's words, I looked around. On closer inspection, some items in the room were missing. It seems like something's missing. Yeah, I threw it away. Your stuff. My stuff? Stunned, I went back to my room. The room was silent, the computer, TV, even my favorite cup were gone. Not just that, the bed and everything else had disappeared. What's the meaning of this? I threw it out because we don't need it anymore. Don't need it anymore? What are we supposed to do now? As I raised my voice, William frowned. Then he averted his gaze and sighed. Frankly, I'm tired of supporting you. What are you talking about? I'm your wife! As I retorted, William grimaced and suddenly raised his voice. Do I have to spell it out for you? Stop leeching off me! For over two decades, I thought I was giving my all to William. Yet, this is how he sees me? I'm not leeching off you. I was just devoted to you. I thought that, but the words wouldn't come. As my strength drained away, William continued. Now that Daniel is working, you've got no reason to leech off me anymore. But... Shut up! I don't want to hear your excuses! William raised his voice. It's no use. My feelings never reached him. At that moment, I heard something snap inside me. It was the sound of the thread of love that had been connecting our hearts, snapping. At the same time, my feelings for William began to fade. Moments ago, we were a couple, but now we're like strangers. William had been using me all along. He never loved me. Otherwise, he wouldn't brazenly cheat and try to drive me out. I don't care what happens to such a man. The only option left is to completely crush him. Resolved, I looked up and faced William. What? Got a complaint? No. If you want me to leave, I will. I briskly closed the living room door behind me and headed to my room. But there was nothing of mine left. Not a single piece of my clothing remained. Don't bother looking. I had the garbage collection service take it all. Which service? There's a flyer here. That one. I picked up the service's flyer from the floor. As I dialed the number, I told William. You'll regret this. Leaving those words behind, I immediately left the house. The call connected right away. I explained the situation, and the person on the line understood immediately. It seemed William's actions had already raised suspicions. So, the garbage collection service had kept everything as it was. I'll be there right away. Thank you. I thanked them politely and ended the call. Afterward, I went to the service's place. After expressing my gratitude, I had my belongings moved to a newly rented storage unit. Relieved that my possessions were safe. I don't think getting away with something like this comes without a price. I clenched my teeth and called Daniel. After briefly explaining the situation, I ended with, So, I've decided to move out, considering a divorce. Daniel, please be prepared for that. All right? Got it. Bye. Daniel hung up. He seemed scared of me. Was I that angry? Puzzled, I put my mobile phone in my bag. And headed to a nearby hotel. I already had a new place lined up. The reason was simple. I had been planning to discuss divorce with William soon. Divorce and move there. That was my plan for starting a new life. The schedule just moved up a bit. So honestly, I wasn't troubled. It's just that plans have moved forward by about two weeks. Two weeks of hotel living. What a waste. A bad habit of a housewife, thinking about waste. I wonder if I should bill him for the hotel expenses. Either way, be prepared, William. I muttered and then started working on the post-divorce actions I had planned in advance. Around ten days into my hotel stay. William called. He raised his voice as soon as I answered. You took my money! What are you talking about? 
Don't play dumb. It's about dad's hospital bills. The hospital just called asking for payment. Oh, that. While thinking, I sighed and responded. You should pay it. It's no longer my concern after being kicked out. I've been transferring living expenses to you. That's supposed to cover it. Yes, but where's that bank account? Isn't it with you now? I retorted nonchalantly. But that account was empty. I couldn't help but laugh, knowing that. There's an account, but it's empty. That's why I'm saying you took the money. I haven't taken anything. Don't lie. Who else could use it? Didn't he realize how little he had transferred? I retorted, almost in disbelief. It was just too little to begin with. If there's no money for the hospital bills, why don't you use your allowance? Allowance! William started to panic. Evidently thinking I didn't know. Since the beginning of our marriage, William had been giving me handwritten salary slips. That was to hide the fact that he was skimming part of his salary. In other words, the skimmed money was William's allowance. I asked Stephen once, how much is William's salary? So, what about it? He looked puzzled but told me. So, I know you've been taking money. When I confronted him, William fell silent. After a long pause, so long I thought the call had dropped, William suddenly raised his voice. What's wrong with me spending the money I earned? It's your fault for spending all the money I gave you. Uh-huh. And then? We're getting a divorce. I'll demand alimony. And you'll return the money you've squandered. William blurted that out, and I smiled triumphantly. I had caught him in his own words. Now William couldn't escape. I was smiling as I retorted to him. I appreciate that. I wanted a divorce too. Come over to discuss it. Ah, uh, no, I mean... I want the divorce too. I'll be waiting with evidence of your infidelity. Though I couldn't see him, I imagined William's face turning pale. It was evident in his shaky voice. What infidelity evidence? Pretending won't help. I have photographic evidence. Photographic evidence? I could almost see William stuttering. Holding back laughter, I continued. I'll give you the address, so let's meet there next Sunday to talk in detail. I unilaterally gave him an address and hung up the phone. I had successfully confronted him with divorce. Now, if I could make him apologize. Honestly, that would be the hardest part. I braced myself for it. Then, on the agreed Sunday. I was at the meeting place well before the scheduled time. I think he should be arriving soon. I glanced around and soon saw William. Over here. I called out to William and he looked up in surprise. Here? Yes. I gave you the address, remember? No, but, this place, whose mansion is it? William looked past me. There stood a mansion worth about one million dollars. Much larger than an ordinary house, it boasted a vast garden. And was three stories high, complete with a home theater. Luxury cars were parked in the built-in garage. Pointing at the mansion, I smiled. This is my house. It's newly built, so it's pretty nice, right? Your house? Yes. I was planning to live here after the divorce, so I started building it a little while ago. Yes. The place I had summoned William to was my newly built house. Naturally, William, who had always seen me as just a housewife, was dumbfounded. Pushing such a William from behind, I entered the house. I led William to the living room. Shall we discuss then? This is my lawyer. I introduced my lawyer, who was waiting inside. But William was hardly in a state to pay attention. His gaze was unsettled. Constantly scanning the surroundings. He didn't even try to look at the photos of his infidelity laid out on the table. He didn't respond when spoken to, frankly, it was hardly a conversation. Eventually, William murmured in a low voice. How did you afford a house like this? Although I was amused by his curiosity, I answered. 
I bought it normally. Liar! A housewife can't afford something like this. To buy a $1 million house, one would need an annual income of around $150,000. However, I had that much income. So, I confidently replied. I earn that much. Do you have a problem with that? No, but how did you? I kind of helped out at a friend's company, and before I knew it, things turned out this way. The story goes back a few years. When I had decided to divorce due to the trouble over my father's hospitalization. I started preparing for it, beginning with finding a job. After the divorce, I couldn't survive without a job. So, I started looking for a job that would allow me to live independently. But there weren't any good ones. That's when I consulted my best friend, Lisa. Why don't you help me with my work? What work do you do? Aquaculture on land. Land-based aquaculture involves artificially creating facilities like pools and breeding fish in them. Despite some disadvantages, it's an eco-friendly method that prevents marine pollution. Lisa's father started it, and now Lisa was taking it over. So, I started working there. William asked tentatively. Once I started helping out, the business suddenly began doing well. What I did was mainly negotiations and administrative work. But Lisa said I was a big help. And I was promoted to an executive position. It was all coincidental, but I believe luck is part of one's ability. Listening to my story, William looked downcast. After a moment of thought, he suddenly looked up. Let's forget the divorce talk. How about we start over? As he spoke, I looked at him coldly and replied. Stop joking. No, it's not a joke, I really want to start over with you. William only wanted my money. So, I raised an eyebrow and retorted. I dislike people who cheat. And those who neglect Stephen. No, about Dad. Quiet. You may not know, but I paid for your father's hospital bills. The money William had given me was indeed very little. After paying for groceries, high utility bills, and other miscellaneous expenses, nothing was left. That was all he ever gave. Naturally, there was no way it could cover Stephen's hospital bills. Initially, I managed somehow, but after starting my job, I paid the bills with my own salary. Despite that, you wouldn't listen to me, and you never visited Stephen. That's because, well, how can I trust someone like that? As I raised my voice, William looked down. Then, the lawyer proceeded with the discussion about alimony. William was speechless. He remained silent and downcast until the end. Urged by the lawyer, William eventually signed the divorce papers. The alimony was set at $30,000. Now that we are divorced, you'll be responsible for your father's hospital bills. Understood. William nodded reluctantly. At least he didn't argue. I was relieved. Finally, I made sure William left, practically chasing him out. It was over at last. The only regret was that I didn't get an apology from William, but I had one last move. That would make him apologize. I couldn't help but smile at the thought. A few days later. After visiting the company, I was called from behind on my way home. Hey, Susan! I turned around to see William. Don't call me like we're familiar. We're divorced now. Shut up! What the hell did you do? William was looking at me with a flushed face. I realized what this was about. Ah, uh, so that was the talk at the company. With that in mind, I said to him with a smile. What do you think I did? Don't mess with me. Tell me how you got me fired. William's outburst was amusing, and I couldn't help but smile. It's your responsibility. You got fired as a consequence for having an affair with the company's clerk. William's affair was with a clerk at his own company. He had been doing as he pleased, thinking he was untouchable as the president. After the divorce was settled, I reported the affair to Stephen. Stephen was furious about William's actions, while also saddened by our divorce. I showed Stephen the evidence photos of the affair, which enraged him further. Then, Stephen made an unexpected offer. 
I'm going to transfer all my company shares to you, Susan. To me? Wouldn't Donald? No, I want to give them to you. Use them to dethrone William from his position. Stephen explained the situation. His company was a corporation. Requiring shareholder meetings or board resolutions for key decisions. Of course, decisions can also be made through board resolutions. However, it wasn't a large company. Stephen owned most of the issued shares. This meant he could make decisions as a single shareholder. In smaller companies, it's common for the president to own the majority of shares. So, by inheriting Stephen's shares, I could exercise voting rights on my own. But it wasn't me who decided to fire William. I informed Donald about acquiring the shares. And just reported William's affair. The rest was Donald's decision. Donald was considerate. That guy! Why is he doing what you say? It's not about doing what I say. He made the decision for the company's best interest. Hearing this, William collapsed on the spot. Then he began to plead, clinging desperately. I was wrong. I apologize, please forgive me. Without a job, I'll be on the streets. But that's not my concern. It's all his responsibility. I won't forgive you even if you apologize. Please, I'm begging you. Forgive me. William repeatedly offered deep apologies right there. I turned away. I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. Why not? If you have the shares. I sold them to Donald and his wife. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. At that moment, I heard William's loud voice. Of course, I pretended not to hear and walked away. After being ousted as the president, William had to leave the company. He might have stayed if he were an employee, but William had joined the company through Stephen's connections and had always been arrogant. I'd never be just an employee. He used to boast. So, as soon as he was removed from his position, he was kicked out. Now he's working a part-time job at a grocery store, but re-employment at his age will be difficult. He's likely to spend his later years in poverty, filled with intense regret. As for me, after the divorce, I became more dedicated to my work. While I don't think I'll remarry, I have several male colleagues. Spring might come again. It was then when I had these thoughts. I received a call from Daniel. I'm bringing my girlfriend over next time. That's wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. I failed in my marriage, but I don't want Daniel to experience the same. But he'll be fine. Daniel is much more sensible than I was.